But I do hope it was beneficial. Jeremiah's going to come up. He's going to join me. And we're going to kind of go through these texts. Um, and if we're going, you guys started on the first. Whoever wants to be maybe a, uh, a spokesperson, come on up. Maybe just give us a brief synopsis, uh, maybe a thesis statement on uh, on these texts if you want. But what we will start, and if you don't, if you don't want to come up, that's okay. Jeremiah can handle all these duties. But I think it was just helpful to go through this as we did. Um, we're going to look at first, everybody, if you want, just turn to Genesis 37. Genesis 37. I'm not going to read it. I may read a couple of things here just for time's sake. But the gist of it, this is Joseph has a dream. Joseph sold into slavery, right? We're pretty familiar with that, that accounting of it. So if we're playing the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'm going to be the ugly, uh, obviously, and I'll be the bad. Jeremiah's going to be the good. But if you guys want to uh, come, come up and, and share maybe something that you had, just a thesis statement or something you talked about on this, we'll let you do that, and then Jeremiah can come in at the end with his uh, kind of thoughts, little nuggets of information that we're looking at with Christ. So, Joseph dream, Joseph sold by his brothers into slavery. So, ugly. Don't tell your brothers your dreams. Right? Is that a... Is that, <laughs> that's essentially... That's a Stephen Furtick. Uh, don't tell your brothers your dreams. That, that's what this is all about, right? No. Obviously. Okay, bad, which we said at the beginning. Remember, bad is not necessarily... Bad. Bad may be true to the human author, but maybe not to the divine author. Bad would be jealousy is a dangerous sin. That's true, right? But is that the main point of why we have this chapter in the Bible? So come on up. Maybe just give some ideas. It can be brief. It can be extensive. Whatever you want to give. Well, just really just nuggets more than anything, uh, going through and finding components that would develop into a sermon, seeing here that Joseph had the special love of his father, um, that he pleased his father as Jesus um, was ple pleasing his father and was well pleased, pleasing his father. He was hated by his brothers. Uh, this, that dream, the prophecy of his reign, um, as that proclamation of the prophecy was presented, uh, to his brothers that created hate. I mean, that's the attention that we see uh, with Christ. Uh, so much hate that they wanted to kill him, um, and he was thrown into a pit. Um, and I, I see, I, I've never, until this reading of it, I missed something in the past, and I don't know if this is really somewhere to go, so maybe it's more of a question. But um, seeing there where Reuben is, is seeking a way to keep him from kill, being killed, he is highlighting this uh, desire to have Joseph restored to his father. And he has his own idea of how he is going to, to hopefully save the brother. Um, but it doesn't work out his particular way. And so anticipating seeing Joseph in the pit, he goes back and the pit, pit is empty. Uh, maybe it's because we just had Resurrection Day recently. I'm thinking of the, <laughs> the empty tomb and that there's another plan. There's a plan of restoration with the Father. Um, and that may be going a little too far. I haven't had a chance to, to simmer in on that too much there. But uh, we do have the substitute of the goat um, that did, um, at least for that time, keep the, it, it thwarted the, 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 the indignation of the brothers. And so that's, that's all I got. I did want to share with you guys something that is kind of interesting that I shared with my guys. I was working at a place one time where there was a, a Muslim reading the Quran, and uh, he was uh, reading, I said, what are you reading? And he said, I'm reading about Joseph. And he said that was his favorite story in the Quran, was about Joseph. I said, oh, I, lo I love that story too. And I said, why do you love that story so much? And he said, well, it kind of makes me think I'm, I'm like Joseph. And I, I'm the one who is um, treated poorly from my brothers, and it gives me hope you know, for myself. And my immediate thought was, well, he's just like a lot of modern evangelical Christians that, that always reading themselves into the passage. 
And I said, well, that's funny. I said, I actually see myself as being like the brothers who killed Joseph. Uh, my indignation, my wickedness. I see Joseph to be like Christ. I had an opportunity to talk about Christ in that particular moment, but I thought that was an interesting thing. That, that is something that unifies us with Muslims is that we uh, tend to be idolatrous just like them and reading ourselves into the message. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Jeremiah, show us, show us how it's done. Well, we could put this into like um, a simple category. Joseph, arguably, uh, he, David, others, maybe the best representations of an Old Testament picture of Christ because there's so much meat on the bone there. I, I love what Charles brought out. We had a bunch in our group. We were just kind of walking through different ones. I had a lot for this one in particular, but the one I would just kind of stand on, obviously, Jesus is the better Joseph. Uh, multiple reasons for that. He's a beloved son. Jesus is a better beloved son because he's the only begotten son. Um, he's betrayed by his own. Jesus is more betrayed by his own. Um, Joseph suffered, but he didn't suffer like Jesus suffered. He was rejected, but he wasn't rejected like Jesus was rejected. Uh, you see that Joseph is exalted to the right hand of a great leader, but Jesus is more exalted to the right hand of an even greater leader. Um, and then there's the plan of redemption. And I love how Charles put that, like they had an idea for one, but Jesus is the better plan for redemption, just as Joseph had to go there and suffer these things so that that dream would be interpreted. There's a famine coming. These people are going to die. There's judgment. Uh, this man must get up there in front of these people so that, and as he reads that to his brothers, obviously there you read Genesis 50, that great passage, so that many might be saved. And that's the point here, that Jesus saves more than Joseph can save. Um, and the one I was talking with Wade about that I love, that I'd never thought about before, he's the better bread of life giver. Uh, Joseph was trying to get them to hoard up food for knowing that there's going to be a, a drought coming. They did. That's why his brothers come. They're looking for food. They're looking for help. They need that. But remember what Jesus said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Well, who is Jesus? God in flesh. He literally said himself, I am the bread of life. In other words, yeah, Joseph may give you bread to sustain you for now, but I give bread for eternal life. Like, and that's the point that you can pick up on there. So simply put, Jesus uh, is the fulfillment of a great foreshadowing of Joseph there. So again, I would just simply say as a text, Jesus is a better Joseph. So that would be the way I would kind of go about that. But you can, as he pointed out, there's many avenues you can get into there depending on your time and how you want to outline that. But you can't miss it like Josh said. My goodness, like that's so obvious in that one. No, absolutely. So, and that's kind of, that's exactly what we were looking at. Just something, something brief just to make us be thinking about these different texts. All right, <laughs> Joshua 23. Joshua 23. Let me get over there. Joshua chapter 23. That's after Joshua 22, right? All right, here we go. Okay, this is uh, Joshua's farewell address. So y Yahweh had given yet rest to Israel at this time. Um, God has been fighting for you, it mentions in the text. Verse 6 says, Be very strong then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. It says, Cling to Yahweh on down. Not one word, or not one word of all the good words which Yahweh your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have come to pass. Uh, in verse 15, Yahweh will bring upon you all the calamitous words until he has destroyed you from off the good land which Yahweh your God has given you. When you trespass against the covenant of Yahweh your God, which he commanded you, go and serve other gods and bow down to them. So, I'll play Mr. Ugly. It says, Ugly, do... What God says, 
so he doesn't whack you, right? I mean, that's pretty simple, right? Just so he doesn't whack you. Now, so a bad interpretation, which isn't horrible, but may not be Christ-centered, would be Joshua was a good leader. True or false? Joshua was a good leader. That's true, right? Um, He feared God. That's true. And God is faithful to his promises. That is true. But I think uh, we'll just go ahead and let... uh, uh, Come on up. Give us... us, Give us your all's notes. Come on up to the microphone. Okay. Up to the microphone. Yeah. Big time. So yeah, more more nuggets that our, our group talked about rather than a thesis statement. But we definitely talked about this this idea of commissioning. Um, Joshua is at the end of his life and he's going out to commission Israel. And we see the same thing uh, with Jesus' earthly ministry at the end of his life. He gives the great commission to his disciples. Um, verse 4, we kind of talked about this, you know, Joshua is allotting to them an inheritance, um, so that parallel a little bit. Um, the message of the hope in the covenant, like, like we were just talking about, but how the old covenant kind of points forward to the new covenant. We see the, the requirements that must be held uh, in the old covenant. It's more of a do this uh, and live, but then that's pointing to the new covenant found in Christ. Uh, it's live and do this. Um, so we kind of see those blessing, uh, the blessings and how they parallel. And then with Joshua himself, I think Jesus is uh, a, a better Joshua. Joshua led his people um, to the promised land, uh, to the, out of physical um, Egypt, to the physical promised land. Jesus leads us out of spiritual Egypt into the spiritual promised land, I guess. So some, some parallels, yeah. Oh, no, that's great. That's yeah. Do you have anything to even add to that? that, was, that was <clears throat> well, great. I would just harp on the covenant. Yeah. Like that would be it. Like Joshua calls them to, you know, reaffirm that. Hey, we're, he's been faithful to us. Let's continue to be faithful to him. Certainly, that would have included sacrifices and offerings at that time. I think Jesus, you clearly see there, is keeping a better covenant than a new covenant, and it's not going to be through rams, goats, bulls. It's going to be through him. He'll be doing the sacrificing to make the better covenant with those people. So. Right. And, I mean, how many Joshuas do we have here today? we got a couple of Joshuas at least. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's the Greek version of the name Joshua? Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, this, he's, yeah. this is literally a picture, a foreshadowing of Jesus. All right, here we go. Let's keep rolling. 1 Kings 21, 1 Kings 21, 1 Kings 21. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not going to do really much reading here. I'll just say we know Ahab coveting after Naboth's vineyard in verse 2 he says give me your vineyard verse 10 he says he brings in two vile men says let them testify against him saying you cursed god and the king then take him out and stone him that he will die so you get the gist of this um the ugly if the king wants your vineyard give it to him so he doesn't kill you i mean it's not wrong but that that's just that's how Stephen Furtick would. How many times have we said Stephen Furtick today? Oh All right, let's find somebody else. We'll, yeah, yeah. T D Jakes is Stephen Furtick's spirit animal, anyway. So, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so bad. Remember, bad doesn't mean bad. It's not wrong. It's true but it may not be given the full gist of the text. Bad. Don't covet like Ahab. True. Don't bear false witness like these two men did. Those are true things. But if that's all we're preaching, we're legalistic preachers. We're saying, we're trying to say God will be pleased with you because of what you've done. No. Like you pointed out, God is pleased with us. Why? Because of what Christ has done. Uh, I'm jumping in. Your turn. You go ahead and do this one. Did y'all have anything on that one? We didn't get part Okay. That's okay. Yeah, I mean, I would just uh, follow up on that. Um, and these people clearly need a Savior. They need to repent. And Elijah just jumps right in and calls people to repent. It's not program, six ways to this, four steps to that, give his vineyard back, let's cut the baby in half and have wisdom. Repent, believe, 
Um, you'll see that in Ahab's life, I and mean, that's what he calls him to. There's other things you can see in there. Um, Jesus clearly prophesied to authority. He had no problem talking down to people that thought they were high. You see that with the Pharisees. You see that with leaders in Rome. Elijah does that here. Jesus does it better. Um, Elijah speaking on behalf of God. Jesus is God. I mean, that's, that's, you can see that clearly in there. Um, you also see that God will judge righteously. And Jesus does bring that clearly. Like, it's easy to read that and get angry and think, man, look at the injustice done to Naboth and these other people. And Elijah's always been trampled on. And, you know, where's God and all that? Well, he's right in the thick of it in sovereignty. But you look at Jesus, who, who brings clear justice. He brings clear righteousness. I mean, he's going to bring clear commands to these people. In other words, he's going to save. That's what he's going to do. Um, and he's going to be the one that fulfills all that. I think it's also a good cautionary tale of sin, too. Um, people simply do not get away with sin. Uh, God will judge righteously. Um, and whereas Elijah preaches that to these people, Jesus not only preaches it, but he brings it. Um, so you can see that all throughout that story. But that would be one, though, and I, I'm glad you said this earlier because we talked about this in our group. You made a great point about like first, second, third tier applications sometimes that might be a little bit more, like Josh made a great point, you got to do the work here. I and mean, this is not just like, oh, there it is. You know, yeah, it's, it's clear in the sense of big Jesus, but sometimes some of those minor points you got to get in there on. I found that one to be like that. Like maybe some second, third tier applications that if you really get in there, kind of like you were mentioning Reuben and Joseph's story. It's, it's there, it's really good. Just you do a little work in getting in there. You're not deviating off, it's not wrong, right? But you're still on the right path there um, and getting into it. Because Wade and I were talking, what you don't want to do is like Spurgeon said, dig another road. Like there's the clear road. Don't go off digging off a path that don't make any sense. But if it's there, I mean, certainly if you've got the time and uh, you want to bring that to it, I, I would go with that. Do you have anything to add? Well, no, just just like what you said, though. These, you know, we're doing, we're playing the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. The bad is a secondary, tertiary application. Yeah. It's true, it's right, but it's not pointing us to Christ. Right. A lot of times it may point us to our self, and we want to be pointing to Christ each time. So, you got an ESV there? I do. Oh, will you do me a favor? I just, I like the ESV in Psalm 119, verses okay. 9 through, what did I say? 9 through 16. If you'll, Psalm 119, 9 through 16, if you'll read that. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Amen. So I like the ESV on that. When I used to teach kids, we every year we would go through this text, really just 9 through 11. But I was, I was a legalistic teacher to children. It can be easy to teach legalistically to children. That's why kind of one idea I have maybe for August is how to teach children um, so we can bring the ladies in. And But we'll talk to the guys, see if that's something that it has interest. But um, the ugly. Memorize Psalm 119 to unlock the blessings of God. All right. Y'all aren't laughing at these. These ugly ones you're supposed to laugh at. Maybe I'm not as funny as I thought. But bad. Bad. This is how I would teach this uh, once upon a time. Be righteous by doing what God has commanded. I mean, that's essentially the gist we get out of this a lot of time. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. And I'm jumping into the good, but I, I, I'm convicted about this. It's like, how can a young man keep his way pure? Well, there is only one young man who has ever kept his way pure, the Lord Jesus. Who has truly guarded his heart? Only the Lord Jesus. Who has, with his whole heart, sought God? Only the Lord 
Jesus. So I'm, that's, I'm off my stump. You can have it now. Yeah, that's the answer. I mean, he's the one that keeps his way pure. Why? Because you need atonement. You and I cannot keep our way pure and satisfy the wrath of God. Jesus had to do that. Jesus had to keep his way pure. He did, sinless life. Therefore, he can be the perfect sacrifice for us. So the application I would give to people is simply this. If you're going to do that, as young men, we've all been there, and still you know, nobody's uh, getting out of spiritual maturity here like we're going to be in that the rest of our life, how do we keep our way pure? Look to Jesus Christ. And he will teach you to keep your way pure. How does he do that? Well, it literally says right there, I mean, application is pretty easy. Pursuit of holiness. What did Jesus do? He pursued holiness. Again, looking to Christ to do that. But he's satisfying that for you. So, yeah, there'll be days you don't get that right. Good news, he did. You're in him, right? But, again, responsibility of man, though. That doesn't mean I just get to go and live any way I want just because. But... I want to be holy as he's holy. How do I do that better? I look to him. Because he's a great example of that. Same thing there. You're pure through what? The word of God. Not my emotions or what I like or maybe something clever that I've conjured up. But like I look to the word of God. Well, who is the word of God? Jesus Christ in flesh. You know, Emmanuel, God with us. There's the word made manifest. And then we delight in his statutes. Nobody loved the word of God like Jesus did. And so if I want to love it more, I want, to, I want to reflect what he's done here and learn that the statutes of God are not to hammer me down, but they're actually to lift me up. They're, they're good in my life. They're good in your life. How are young men holy? They, they seek after the word of God often. And it becomes a joy to them. Jesus is that fulfillment right there. And he also talks about like meditating on the word of God if you read down to verse 16. There's another good application that Jesus is constantly doing. What's he always teaching his disciples to do? Let's pray and let's study the word together. Let's listen to him as he teaches. He's always bringing them away. If you ever notice that, they do how to do ministry, but he's bringing them back to do what? Settle down. Let's get back into the word of God. Let's pray together. Let's meditate together on these things that we've learned. Let's think through it. Why? Because we're prone to wonder. You know, I mean, look at the life of Peter. My goodness, if there was ever a young man that needed Psalm 119 right there. I mean, constantly being reminded, man, I got to look to him. And notice the progression of his life, by the way, when you see that. The same man that's out here trying to cut ears off in the garden is the, also the same guy preaching in the early part of Acts. And look at the difference. And all of it was what? He's just looking to Christ for maturity to grow up in those ways. So there's a great example, in my opinion, of Psalm 119 being lived out in a man. Like, look at the young version of that, and then look at the seasoned version of that. And what was the difference? Looking to Christ. That was it. So. No, no. Absolutely. Um, I know you guys on this side did work on Jeremiah 2911. Do y'all want to have somebody come up and represent your group, or do you want Jeremiah to do it since he was part of your group? I got a point at Jeremiah. All right. So, Jeremiah, is that where we're at? Jeremiah 29 11? Yeah. I'm so excited that we put this in here because it's a very misused verse. So, Jeremiah 29 11, I bet you've got this memorized. But what I don't want us to do, I've been guilty of this. You hear this verse because you know how abused it is so often. Sometimes. I've been guilty of rolling my eyes when I hear this verse. It is holy inspired scripture. And just because some people mistreat it doesn't mean that we do not take encouragement from it. And we certainly don't sin against the author of scripture by rolling our eyes when we hear scripture. Praise the Lord when we hear scripture, even though we know something is taken, kicking and screaming out of context all the time. So Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for peace and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. So ugly. God must think I'm awesome because he has some great plans to prosper me. Thank you for that. Yeah. You're humoring me now since I begged for laughs a minute ago. All right, the, the bad. So, God is faithful to his people Israel. That's, that's not bad. That's true. Absolutely it's true. But how do we flesh that out knowing that this is a 
book from Genesis to Revelation centered on Christ? Tell us how, Jeremiah. Well, as we talked in our group, target audience is important there and what's going on. So if you'll read that correctly, as he says there, I know the plans that I have for you. Use plural. Like he's talking to Israel here. This is a prophecy. And like Josh pointed out really well in our group, um, what's about to happen is captivity. And it's coming. And there's nothing to do about that. Like the Lord has declared this is happening. But the great news is there is hope. And hope is not, hey, you're going to claw your way out of that. You know, you're going to overcome these people. No, hope's coming in the form of a Messiah. And so the way I would kind of head it would be very simple. Jesus is the plan. Jesus was the plan. Jesus is always the plan. <laughs> uh, the answer to that is very clear right there in text. Who's the hope for these people? Jesus Christ. What's the future? Redemption through Jesus Christ. Um, what's all this blessing? Jesus is the blessing. Jesus is the prosperity. Uh, you see that all throughout the New Testament when he's talking to people and he's using the ideologies of, of poor and wealthy. Well, who are the blessed people? The wealthy are those who are rich in Christ. That's the example there that you're seeing. And so when you read that, as he said, don't gloss over that. That's good news for everybody. Uh, God does care about you. <laughs> So much so that he sent his only begotten son to die in your place that you might be forgiven of all the iniquity towards him and made new in his adopted family now. That's good news for everybody, not just Israel, but we mentioned Gentiles too, right? That's a hard lesson for Jews, particularly you read in the New Testament, for them to continue to swallow. That's what Jesus is always coming back to with these Pharisees. Like, you think you're the only ones that God is out here thinking about, and that's not true. He's got a great plan, and the plan was standing in front of them. And they just simply couldn't see it the whole time. So, yeah, that's a great passage to go back. But, you know, very simple. Jesus is the prosperity. He's the hope. He's the future. He's the plan. And you can clearly see that in that text there. And by the way, some of that plan is suffering, which they had a hard time getting. Josh preached that very well. Like, you cannot miss that part of it. The plan was that he suffers not you in the sense of like having your sin laid on you, but having it laid on Jesus, that he would suffer in your stead. So, again, there's plenty of meat on the bone there for that one. And I forgot where Hosea was for a second. Hosea chapter 3. Hosea chapter 3. Um, I do have a question. Why do people not interpret Hosea 3 the same way that they interpret Jeremiah 29 11. People don't do that, right? I know the plans you have for me. Well, I know the harlot you have for me is what he's saying. People don't do that because they only want to grab on to the, the verses that have a positive spin on it. Well, let's look at Hosea chapter 3. Yahweh said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by her companion and is and adulteress, even as Yahweh loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I bargain again for her, or for I bargain for her my, for myself for fifteen shekels of silver, and a homer and a half of barley, and so forth. Verse five. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek Yahweh their God, and David. Ding, 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 keyword, their king, and they will come in dread to Yahweh and to his goodness in the last days. So, ugly, go marry a harlot. So, bad, God was faithful to Israel even though they were unfaithful to him. Every bit of that is true. It just may not flesh out the entirety of the truth pointing to Christ. Go ahead, Jeremiah. Yeah, so we actually got a chance to cover that one, and this one sort of jumps off the page. This is another one we talk about, like, it, it's hard to miss this one, like when you see it reflected in the New Testament. So you see here just another foreshadowing that redemption is going to be accomplished through Jesus Christ. Okay, so we see that in the life of uh, Hosea here for Gomer, because you're looking at this as a perfect example of how Jesus is going to die for his bride. He's going to give everything he has. He pays the price for his bride. And his bride, by the way, is, is wayward. I mean, that's who we are. The church 
is full of wicked, sinful people that the Lord has made new by grace. So you can see that all throughout Hosea's actions here. Um, you see a, a, an obedience and sacrificial love. You see a restoration and renewal. You see redemption. All those words are just really clear throughout that text. So that's a really good one if you ever wanted to grab one chapter out of the Old Testament and preach salvation. I mean, in looking at the church in general. Um, the one I loved about it is actually something I thought about when we went back to the conference. Uh, we were talking about assurance, and, and I had a chance to preach on the assurance of the church. And Jesus, you know, famously says, I'll build the church. But what does that entail? That means he's done everything. The whole cost is on him because he loves it so much that he literally left heaven to come here to purchase the freedom of the church. And like that's so powerful when you think about that in context of Hosea, what he's done to redeem these people. Like literally the entire cost and more than we can even imagine has been paid by him for that. So really great, I mean five simple verses, but a lot packed in there. Like when you look at that in the New Testament context. All right. Fantastic, we've got one more. And this one was inspired um, by a book I was just reading, Patrick Abendroth just brought out a book on the active obedience of Christ. I highly recommend that book. But um, he quotes this verse and how it's misused often. So <clears throat> Micah 6a, a lot of you guys probably have this memorized. I remember helping my kids memorize it. Uh, when they were young. Actually, will you read it? Since I have great affection for the ESV on these verses my kids have memorized in their life because that's the version. Let's read Micah 6 8 for us. Yeah, it says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. Thank you. So the ugly, be humble or God will humble you. And that one can be really painful to people in our camp too. Because the people, a lot of people that we look up to, they would use that verse that way. And we have probably been guilty of using that verse that way on occasion. Maybe, maybe with our kids on occasion instead of uh, being Christocentric parents as well. But that one hurts a little bit because be humble or God will humble you. Are we in Christ or are we not? But anyway, moving on, the bad. Okay, to live a fruitful life, do justice. To live a fruitful life, love mercy, be humble. Are those true things? Absolutely. But this verse points to another. Jeremiah's going to tell you. Yeah, uh, the way I wrote this down, um, I mean, as simple as simple could get, like Jesus Christ is the true Micah 6, 8 man. Um, and what I mean by that is that God's expectations for his people are fulfilled in Jesus. Like, who, who loves justice or does justice more than Jesus Christ? He's perfect. Um, who is more loving to kindness than Jesus Christ? Uh, nobody. And then, my goodness, who would be more humble than Jesus Christ? And so you look at that, and the things that God loves is Jesus. Like, and here's the good news. You, being in the family of God, are covered by the one that God loves. So when he looks on you, what does he see? But one that he loves. Why? Because the one that fulfilled all those things covers us. So the good news for all of us today, Jesus has done justice. Jesus loves mercy and kindness. Jesus walks humbly with God and imputed righteousness to his people. Congratulations. You're in the family of God because of Jesus Christ who fulfilled all those things. I mean, you can get deeper into it like in the demonstrations of mercy. We talked about that a little bit as he heals people, as he shows compassion to people. Uh, what a great outline for our life that we ought to be doing that to those as well. You look at justice. Notice the Bible constantly declaring just one word. He doesn't put some kind of terminology in front of it. It is the social justice and racial justice and every other justice. No, Jesus is justice. That's the important thing to remember. You can see that all throughout the scriptures. And then obviously humility. 
If you're ever trying to figure out, like, how would I humble myself, live like him, that's humility. Uh, who thought it not robbery, right? Like, think about that, to humble himself and come here and die on our behalf, that he wouldn't try to rob the glory of God, but like, that is the glory of God, that he would send his only begotten to die for us. So lots in that passage as well, and, and plenty to pick apart there. There's a good, good, good verse there. Uh, to look at lives that we have simply because of what Jesus has lived out on our behalf. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's fantastic. And when I was looking at this, uh, I kind of stretched it out looking at verses 14 through 16. And what's he saying there? He says, you'll eat, but you won't be satisfied. You'll try to remove something for safekeeping, but you will not cause anything to escape. It says, you'll sow, but you won't reap. You'll tread, but um, you will not drink the wine. And that is, to me, the opposite of being hidden in Christ. We don't tread, and we get to drink the wine. We are completely satisfied in him even when we haven't eaten. We didn't even try, and we receive those benefits. It is the opposite. It's being in that new covenant, knowing that you have no money, come and eat. You have nothing to buy with, come and drink. It's, it's the exact opposite, kind of like uh, Wade was talking about this anti Type. This is an anti-type of Christ. These people, Israel, disobedient. But we, through the obedience of Christ, get what we don't deserve, the wonderful grace. And I think we'll wrap it up there, guys. That was our last text, right? Yep. Let's pray, and then you guys are dismissed. Father, thank you for these men coming out to teach us and to have fellowship. I ask that you would... Bless the Lord's Day services at all of our churches tomorrow. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the humility of Jesus Christ coming and living as one of us to redeem us. In Jesus' name, amen.